Zach here from Universal Air, and today we're gonna to be going over different tips and tricks for fittings and trying to make an overall healthy air system. If you get all the leaks out of your system, it's actually really enjoyable to have an air system in your vehicle. If you don't, however, you're always waiting for the compressors to fill up the tank just to be able to get the vehicle up and drive. And now we're gonna show you how to prevent these problems and have a nice system. So you may be asking, what is the purpose of fittings and do I really need good fittings or is these cheap ones that we get at the local hardware store good enough? So let's go ahead and go through some of the key differences between them and the reasons why you should choose one versus the other. So here we have quite an assortment of fittings. We have a regular pipe fittings that are going to be on threaded connections as well as some reducer fittings that are going to take from one size thread to another and different types of hose connection fittings which will take a thread in on one side and then the hose will push into the other. The most important thing you need to watch out for when you're selecting your fittings is you want to make sure you do some type of non-ferrous metal, either brass or you can even look at the stainless ones, but once you see the price of stainless, you're not going to want to buy them. Um, a quick easy way to tell is if you take a magnet and you go through and you touch the fittings, if they don't stick to it, then they're going to be brass. Some like this one right here is a brass, it's been nickel plated so it looks pretty, but yet it still is not, not magnetic. Now these two right here, this is a zinc plate, these are both zinc plated steel fittings. These are typically used in hydraulic fittings, which are fine because with hydraulic oil, it'll actually prevent the inside from corroding. If you take a look in this one right here, this is a used fitting, you can see that there's quite a bit of rust building up on the inside of it. Even though it was zinc plated to prevent the rust from collecting in there, it still has started to grow. And what will happen is that rust will get clogged in your valves and make your valves start leaking over time. Now a quick easy way to tell is you just take a simple magnet, run it over, and when it grabs them, that means those are magnetic or they're steel fittings that have been coated in some type of protection. So by taking a little pick in here and we rub it around the inside, you can see all the junk that's coming out of it. That's what's gonna get stuck in your system. Now the other thing is with steel fittings and the rust that comes off them, when you thread a steel fitting into say an aluminum tank, which most people are running now to prevent rust from the tank, when you get little bits of steel coming off, steel and aluminum don't like each other. What end up happening is the aluminum will be, get corroded because it is an anode for the steel. So especially if you're in a salty environment, like if you live by a beach, get the salt, moisture, salt water moisture from the compressor into the tank, it's gonna mix with the steel that's inside the tank and it'll actually eat through the tank over time. You get little pinholes inside your aluminum tank which aren't supposed to corrode, but because of the steel content that's in there, will make them corrode. Now right here we have several different examples of fittings. We have both the non-DOT approved type as well as the DOT approved type. Now there is also what they call push connect fitting where you push the hose inside the fitting as well as compression where you slide it in, tighten up and actually swedge that ring onto the tubing. A few important differences for our applications being in the custom car side is the non-DOT type. It, all of them work the same concept where you have a tubing that comes through, it's retained by like a clip that'll actually bite into the hose. And that's the whole purpose of that is to keep the hose against this O-ring to keep it sealed. Different manufacturers do them a different way. Um, this one does more of like a like a um, circular with teeth on the internal. This one does a collet that'll expand and bite. And then this one does a like a waffle type serration that'll expand and bite in. On the compression type, this one right here, this will actually be permanently deformed around the tube and seat against the internal of here as well as the inside of that. Actually, here'd be a better view of it, this internal surface here, as well as the internal surface up here. Um, and then the push connect type DOT, same style. The tubing's retained by this clip, as well as against the O-ring, but they add in this internal tube support on all of them, even the compression. And what that'll do is it'll keep the tubing itself square and sealed against the O-ring, whether it's a, an X-ring like that or an O-ring like this one and it'll keep it airtight even if you side load or the, the hose isn't going in perfectly straight into the fitting. Now my own personal type of favorite retention is this collet style. When the, the collet's inside here and you push the hose in, the collet will actually deflect out inside this surface here. And what that'll do is in order for the hose to come out, the collet will bite in harder against the hose to actually keep it more retained. Opposed to this style where it has the little waffle springs, I like to call them, with that, if you deflect that or you overbend that piece right there, it'll make it to where the hose can actually just be ripped out of the fitting. 
which the higher pressure you run, the more pulling force that's on the actual hose, which the more likely you are to actually pull it out out of the fittings themselves. So there's two main types of fittings. You have the industrial line as well as the DOT approved line. The industrial line, they don't have the internal tube retention to keep it square. So if the hose is a little bit crooked, it's gonna leak in a big heavy machinery. Who really cares if it leaks a little bit? Um, we're not trying to keep a vehicle up overnight or even driving down the road. For the DOT approved line, they have to do this internal tube support because of the vibration on the hose as you're driving down the road could cause these fittings to leak or burp out a little bit every time the hose is pushed or pulled a certain way. And for us, we want to be able to leave these vehicles up for overnights, days, or weeks on end without it falling down or leaking at all. Now, when it comes to the actual cost of the fittings, unfortunately, the more expensive fittings generally have more parts in them to try and solve many different problems, which do lend to the additional cost you end up paying. For example, this fitting right here is the, the lowest cost unit that we have short of the um, compression fittings and it has very few components. It does have a plastic OD collet which is used to release the spring off of the um, tubing and just a simple o-ring all inside this simple cavity opposed to like the um, SMC fittings right here they do a pretty intricate spring retainer right here for the for the tubing, the tubing support inside, and even the Alcon units they have quite a bit of machining inside here along with the you know, the collet slash um, release unit that they have. So yes, you do end up paying more for this type of fitting opposed to this type of fitting, but to come out in the morning and have your car stay up opposed to driving down the road and always keep hitting the switch because it's cut leaking out a little bit, it's well worth the money. Now that we've pretty much eliminated all the non-DOT approved fittings, let's go ahead and focus on the DOT approved stuff here. Now when it comes to the choice between a compression fitting and a push to connect style fitting, the compression fittings themselves are a good choice. They are a little bit more finicky where if you do over tighten this nut, you will over compress this um, ferrule. And at that point, the fitting can leak. And also when you go to actually reuse the fitting or take it apart and reassemble, you, you only have so many times. Every time you retighten that nut up on the ferrule, you are compressing a little bit every single time opposed to the push connect fittings. As long as you don't score or nick this O-ring, you can reuse this fitting, fitting many different times. It's a really simple process to remove the hose, put it back in, opposed to the compression style where once it's in there and you tighten it up, you can't ever change the length of the hose. Like if it's a little bit too long, you can't clip a little bit off the end and push it back in. You have to cut the whole thing off, replace, replace the ferrule, and then reassemble the whole unit. Now when it actually comes to sealing up your fittings on the thread side, you have two real options. You can either go with the liquid type, like a Loctite 545 or 565, or regular Teflon tape, similar to this, where you wrap the threads around it. Now the Teflon tape does work fine. It is a little trickier to make sure that you actually apply it correctly. Whereas the liquid stuff, you literally just drop it on the threads, tighten it up. Now it's important for you to know that the difference between the 545 and the 565, which are the two most popular versions of the liquid sealant, is that the 545 is designed for easy disassembly, whereas the 565 is designed for high vibration environments. What that actually means is when you go to disassemble it or take it apart for whatever reason, for servicing or if you gotta replace something, the 545 will come out real easily, opposed to the 565 where you a lot of times will have to add a little bit of heat to it or really rank on it to get it to break loose. Um, for most of my experience with the custom car side, the 545 is more than sufficient. I haven't had any of them loosen up over time and start to leak. Whereas the 565, yes, of course, it's never gonna loosen up, but if you ever need to take it apart, you're gonna wish you had used the 545. Now the proper way to wrap a fitting is for me, I hold it in my right hand and I put the Teflon tape in my left hand and put that over the top of the threads and then wrap it like you're tightening the fitting into the port that you're gonna be screwing into. You wanna do two to three wraps of the Teflon and when you're done with your wrap, you break it off and you wanna make sure it's very important that you don't have any of the Teflon over the edge of the fittings. What'll happen when you tighten it up is if it was covering the fitting, as you tighten it up, it'll end up cutting that off and then spit the Teflon into the air system. That is the advantage to the liquid side because with that, the liquid's not gonna get stuck inside the valve as opposed to the Teflon, it can get stuck inside your valve, make them not open up or close. Now the proper way to install a fitting is you put it in there and you're supposed to run it down to your hand tight. And then from there, you wanna do, there's one rotation and a half to two rotations. Because the fitting itself is on a taper, the tighter you go in there, the more it'll actually wedge out the female side of the thread. 
If you really crank them down, they've been known to actually split the female side, which can cause damage. If you look here, it is normal to see thread sticking out of the fitting with it fully tightened up and sealed. Now, when it comes time to cut the hose, do not use your regular wire cutters. If you go through and cut it, once you cut it, you're gonna end up with a real funky cut in there and it's not gonna seal up with your fittings. Now the proper way is you use an airline cutting tool like this one. You put the airline in there and then you just give it a squeeze and it makes a nice perfect square cut on the end of the hose. The other route if you don't have one of those is believe it or not a simple razor blade. And what you want to do is put it against a nice sturdy surface and when you put it on there and you go to cut it you want to make sure you cut it in a smooth motion straight down. And that will also get you a nice clean cut. On these airline cutters, they're essentially a razor blade inside the cutter. So you just put it in there, squeeze, perfect cut every time. When it comes to actually working with the fittings, you simply push the hose in on the push to connects, and as you can tell, it bites onto it and holds it. There is this ring around the perimeter of the hose. If you want to release the hose after you let the air out, you hold that ring down, and the hose pulls right out. Now, generally when you do reuse a fitting or you pull the hose out, you will get a few scratches on there. It is good practice to actually reclip the end of the hose. However, a lot of the times you can get away with it. I'll usually put them back in there and test it for leaks. And if it starts leaking, then I'll go ahead and reclip the end and put it back into the fitting. With air going into the fitting to check for leaks, just take some simple soapy water, give it a good spritz. We look for any bubbles. This is a DOT approved fitting, so we can move the line sideways and it doesn't leak at all. We can even go to the point where it's almost kinking and there's still no leaks out of the... Now another little trick for you when it comes time to release the hose out of the fittings, if you take a wrench the size that your tubing is, you could actually use that to push down on the ring because some of the rings get kind of small to hold onto. It makes it to where you can easily pull it out. Now to use the liquid sealant, I prefer to put a few drops on the edge of the fitting as you start with the leading edge. Now if there's a little bit of sealant on the end, just for a precautionary measure, I'll wipe that off. And then same thing, thread it in until it's hand tight, then you go one and a half to two turns with the wrench. Now to work with the compression style fittings, you do unthread them and you have the three parts inside there. So with the top nut still loose, you can take your tubing and push it down inside there. Make sure it goes all the way down. And then you have to tighten up this top lock nut to crimp in that ferrule. One turn. That's supposed to be how tight you make a compression nut. You go hand tight and then you do one turn with the wrench. If you pull on it, it doesn't come off. With that, we can go ahead and leak test it. And as you can tell, we have no leak. If we were to actually over tighten it, at this point it's not leaking, but if we go to reuse it, from here we can take it off. You can see it's really stuck on there. You're not going to be able to reuse this fitting. So at this point, what you'd have to do is cut your hose off and throw away your fitting. That's the downside is if you go too tight with these, you can never take them back apart. Now in general, with the D once you go the DOT style, you're gonna have a hard time getting this back on. So usually if you go to reuse this, you're gonna be replacing your fitting. And now for the fittings I absolutely despise, the non-DOT fitting. You put it in there, everything looks good. And then as soon as you put a little bit of side load on it, you start leaking driving down the road, the thing's going to be moving a little bit, and over time it's going to start leaking faster and faster. Now on this one I purposely score on the hose just to show you that if your hose has a big scratch along the side of it, it can allow air to leak past your fitting. What we went ahead and did is we purposely put some scratches in the hose so you can see that air can go past, come out the end, go up along the side, and go past that o-ring and make it leak. Now what I personally prefer to do when I'm running lines throughout the vehicle, so I'll just take some regular old electrical tape and just go ahead and wrap the end of the hose. 
I'm gonna go ahead and close off the end. And what that'll do is as you're shoving it along underneath the car, one, you're not gonna get dirt inside the end of the hose, which as soon as you plug it into your bag or your valves, when the air moves back and forth, it's gonna end up shooting all that dirt and grime inside the valves, making them stick. Um, but after you run all through the car, then once you get done, you can just simply unwrap the hose. Then just clip your end to your length that you want it at. And you have a nice, clean, pristine hose right here where you're gonna be sealing. If it starts scratching and gouging along the back side of it, as long as you don't have to clip that far over time, you never have to replace this hose. There's nothing more frustrating than finishing a full install and having one fitting link up here. And then as you look at your hose, you have a big gouge that goes from this end all the way down. And if you were to cut the gouge out, your hose would be too short. So using a little bit of electrical tape is cheap insurance to making sure you have good seals on your fittings. Well, on top of, of sealing your fittings, there is a type of fitting that's called a JIC or an SAE fitting. They're either 37 or 45 degrees. This is a tapered fitting and they do have metal seats in there. So when you tighten this up, you're supposed to go to its hand tight and then you do a quarter turn. That will seal the fitting. Do not put Teflon tape in here. If anything, that's going to have a probability of getting stuck inside this metal seat and make your leaks worse. So for all flare fittings like this style, do not add Teflon tape or liquid thread sealant or anything like that. You don't need it for the flare. And that all should go without saying that don't put anything around the hose when you go to stick in the fitting. You don't need silicone or anything like that. These fittings are designed to seal with an O-ring around the outside of the tubing. And if you have gouges like this inside your fitting, silicone's not gonna help you. You're gonna have to replace your hose. Now, when it actually comes to measuring out your fittings to know what size threads you actually need, there's a few things you should know. NPT, or National Pipe Thread, actually is tapered, and they're basically, they're basing the size off the inside of the pipe. So if you take a ruler to the outside of the thread, you're gonna get a different reading. This fitting right here, for example, is an eighth inch NPT, and it measures out to about three eighths of an inch. As well as if you take a quarter inch NPT, that'll measure out to be about a half an inch. And then you keep going on up, three eighths NPT measures out to just shy of three quarters of an inch. And then the true half inch NPT is almost seven eighths of an inch. So when you're trying to figure out what size pipe you need, my general rule of thumb is it's basically the a size down from quarter inch measurement. So just under half inch is about three quarters of an inch. Just under three eighths is really about a half an inch. And then quarter inch NPT is just about three eighths of an inch. So it's kind of the next step down when you're trying to figure out what size threads you need. Now when it comes to actually trying to make an air system move fast, some people will think, oh, I need half inch ports on everything but keeping in mind that it's actually the inside of the pipe, not the outside of the threads. So here is two half inch fittings for half inch airline. This one is 3 8 NPT, this one is half inch NPT. And if you look up the middle where the air is actually flowing, the hole is identically the same size. This is because these fittings won't restrict the flow and you don't need to have half inch ports on everything in order to get the speed that you can out of a half inch hose because airline is based off of the outside diameter of the tube. So a half inch outside tube really only is 3 8 on the inside. So a 3 8 NPT pipe fitting is designed for 3 8 ID flow, which is all you need for a half inch tube. Same thing goes for the different sizes. A 3 8 NPT fitting like this one is 3 8 on the outside and a quarter inch on the inside. Now that you got everything installed on your vehicle, it's time to check for leaks. My suggested method is to go through and first soak everything down with soapy water. I prefer to do it before actually installing it on the vehicle, especially the tank, because there's a lot of connections there. So I will fill up the tank outside the vehicle off of shop air and then soak everything down to see if anything leaks. It's a lot easier to fix it now than once it's installed in the vehicle, you gotta pull it out or try to wrestle to get the fittings out. Once you soak it down and you find anything leaking, make sure to address those. Hopefully it's not a hose issue where you have to rerun that line. Afterwards, I suggest to leave the vehicle up overnight and do a long-term test. If you come out in the morning and look at it and let's say the entire vehicle's down and you click the key on and you notice that the compressors are turning on, most likely you have a leak between the compressor and the tank or the tank and the valve. Since the valves will use air pressure to actually close themselves, if there's a leak and the tank pressure drops, the pressure will backflow the valves and go back into the tank. If you have a leak on any individual corner, I would address those ones checked both at the bag and at the valve 
because if only that one corner fell down, it's gotta be between the valve to the bag. If the entire front comes down, same thing, check to turn your key on. If the pumps turn on, then you have a supply leak and you need to address that. Now, if you, the vehicle stays up, but you turn the key on and the compressors turn on, most likely it's a supply leak. Now, if the pumps turn on for a very short period of time, it may just be the temperature change. If you filled up your tank at, when you were done and it was hot out and then overnight it cools down and you check in the morning and the pumps turn on, if the air cools down, it will condense and compress so it won't have the same pressure. So it might have been low enough to trip your compressors to turn back on. Well, that's gonna do it for this one. Hope you found the information helpful. Fittings aren't the most exciting thing in the world, but they do lead to the most headaches. So hopefully this information can help guide you in your choices for your air system, as well as help diagnose any problems you may have. Please comment down below what you would like us to talk about in the future. I think more in-depth stuff like this will help different people on their installations and diagnosing problems. Uh, if you like the video, please like it and subscribe to see more in the future. Talk to you soon.